You are listening to Creating Active Lives with me, Sarah Blytho, and my regular weekly guests, and we are all here to share the research, the science, and the strategies, as well as some of the fun, to help you to create a more active life. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Creating Active Lives with me, Sarah Belitha, and my special guest this week, Sarah Jane Lewis. Sarah is known as the Etsy queen. If you don't know what Etsy is, then if you go and find out, she's a thriving entrepreneur and has really made herself uh, a name for herself on the world's most beloved and most popular online marketplace. Um, she's got five successful Etsy stores, and she'll talk about those a little bit at the end. But she really knows the ins and outs of selling on the platform. But we're not here to talk about Etsy. We're talk about we're here to talk about Sarah Jane's kind of fitness cycle. I'm going to call it a cycle because I think a lot of us think getting fit is about once you get fit, that's it job done rest of life it's all linear and it's all go 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 from there but actually for a lot of us and Sarah Jane's going to talk about this we might get fit for a reason then we get unfit again and then we get fit again it's it's a much more cyclical a much more kind of bumpy ride into fitness so Sarah Jane thank you so much for coming along and tell us a little bit about you and then we'll talk about your your fitness Experience. Yeah, no, sure. Um, so yes, thank you for having me. I am SJ the Etsy Queen or Sarah Jane, whichever you prefer. Um, I'm a mum. I've got two children of my own. I lost a baby and I've got a stepson. Um, divorced, um, since met with a new partner and happily ever after, but not married. Um, and life is good. Yeah, so entrepreneur um in regards to having my own businesses and running my own shops and coaching people so a little bit of everything as you can imagine mum entrepreneur person relationships you know <laughs> running a house there's there's a lot going on and and fitness probably gets pushed down and down and down the list a bit it's like i'll do that later i'll do it later I'll do it. oh it's bedtime it does, yes. which when you're busy, it's really hard, isn't it? And it's one of the reasons why, you know, one of the things I really want to help people with is creating an active lifestyle because then your activity is part of your day rather than being something you have to take time out of your day to do. So what are your earliest memories then of exercise and fitness? Um, I think, to be honest with you, I mean, I'm an 80s baby, you know, everyone in like around me women wise were all conscious of their weight they're all on what's that sweetness sugar that you used to put on your cereal yeah. and special k and everybody was like worried about being fat and you know very self-conscious but exercise I don't remember it ever being a part of life apart from games and PE at school you know I'd, now we've got so access to so many different plans and regimes and classes. I think that my earliest memory is potentially, you know, like a yoga DVD or like a really bad aerobics DVD, you know, something your mum would have had um, while she's eating a special K and starving herself. I think that's kind of my associations with it. And just my mum constantly worried about her weight. And um, she went through periods of her life of being overweight and being skinny and being overweight you know for various reasons and I think for me I was never conscious of my weight and I can remember being 18 and eating and drinking whatever I want never bothered about the size of my clothes never even crossed my mind never a conscious thought whether my belly was flat whether my bum was big I've always been flat chested I've never had big boobs I seem to have skipped that generation with like my mum and my nan always had big boobs but I, I never had that um it wasn't until I got pregnant and all oh, did I eat. Oh, I loved being pregnant and I loved eating everything. <laughs> it was just like, but with that, I ballooned and I was big. But reasonable, I don't know, it's different these days. Like being a mum and everything, it changes with the trends and the decades and everything. Um but yeah, I used it as an opportunity to eat a lot of food. I don't know about you when you had babies. I just kind of indulged myself a little bit too much. I think there's always been that message, hasn't it, that you're eating for two. But in actual fact, you know, the, the advice, the evidence, all the recommendations now are actually no. Yeah. You, you eat for one, but you eat better yeah. than you were before. It's quality rather than quantity. But of course, we didn't know that. And there were a lot of things, you know, you go back a few decades and it was, who we gain a stone with every child in the 
that's that's your weight moving forward. Every every child you have, you'll be a stone heavier and a stone heavier and a stone heavier for the rest of your life. So if like me, you've had three, then you'd be three stone heavier for the rest of your life. But it's you know we now know that's not the right way of doing it. It's not healthy. But unfortunately, for a lot of people, there's a lack of advice, and certainly in the eighties, there probably was as well a lack of advice about not just nutrition but also about exercising. It's kind of a little bit, oh, well, you, you know, better to rest, better to do it. Whereas now we're so much more aware, aren't we, that it's it's so important to stay active, which in what, whatever that means to you throughout the pregnancy. So precisely. Yeah. yeah. When did when did getting fit then become a goal? Um, I think you've mentioned to me before that it was after your first child. But so what happened after, you know, after like you've said you gained a lot of weight. Um, what happened when you when you'd had the baby? Um, so I gained the weight and uh, obviously the weight kind of stays put, the baby comes out, but you don't necessarily shrink back to pre-pregnancy weight. Um, and after that initial kind of resting period, I think I must have been, or my daughter must have been about six months old when I started to go to Slimming World, you know, down those routes and walk in and get my steps in and ultimately took up um, Couch to 5K, which I was on maternity leave. So I'd put her in a pushchair and would go for a run. And uh, and that was great in regards to getting out and getting exercise. And I had like a plan. I had some sort of structure, although Slimming World is disastrous. And I think in a number of ways that impacted my daughter's eating habits, which I didn't connect the two at the time in regards to here's one thing for you to eat, but mummy's eating something different because she's fat and trying to lose weight, which at the time, which I mean, I was late twenties. I didn't, I regret it now wholeheartedly. I wish I hadn't have gone down that route, but she was pre- witness to um, the slimming route uh, world groups you know everybody clapping because you had a bloody mars bar and not an avocado stupid things like that like really backwards knowledge we were being fed about nutrition like can i just say you know there are a lot of people out there who who really do like these um, weight loss groups and find them really really helpful but they're not for everybody and like i say for a lot of people it, it adds undue pressure um, so it's not always the answer, just to sort of say, you know, for fairness, that they do work for a lot of people. But yeah, <laughs> no, 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 100 percent for me, it, it did and it didn't. I realised later on that there was kind of I didn't get the benefit from it. I didn't gain any knowledge. So then I put on the weight again without really understanding why and, and kind of the correlation between calories in, you know, and like active lifestyle that didn't really come together and I think what I did notice was um the pressure to get back to being skinny mummy again you know to be attractive the impact was is that um my then husband we didn't have like close relations for about 18 months after childbirth because I wasn't the the shape that he expected or or would find attractive which ultimately kind of added to a list of (laughs) resentments that um resulted in our divorce but yeah it's uh, it's a lot of pressure that women feel after childbirth to get back to normal get back to being but your body's been in a literal car accident and your hormones are all over the place you've got this being to look after and it just there's just a lot of pressure to be something that you're no longer able to be yeah that's it you know having a baby does change you um and but physically you know physiologically your body does change all sorts of things happen when you're pregnant in order to facilitate childbirth um and it takes time for things to go back to the way they were and the problem is i think a lot of people aren't they don't give themselves that time they don't give themselves the months that it's going to take. It's taken nine months to go from zero to baby. It's going to take you probably the same like similar sort of length of time to get back to the way you were. But it's gradual and it's also complicated, isn't it, by the fact that you've now got somebody depending on you for survival. Um, you can't just say, right, weather's quite nice. I'm going out for a run now. It's can't do that. Can't do this. Um, so it's really hard. And I think it's so important that, you know, people coming out of pregnancy 
recognize that it's not all about snapping back into shape it's about you know doing it your way and and that might be slower it might take you six nine twelve months even longer to get back to where you were if that's actually where you want to get back to you might decide actually you know my my expectations my beliefs about my body have changed so this is where I want to be and I think that's that's a big shift isn't it is is saying no this is what I want to achieve and I think there needs to be more women like yourself out there in supporting encouraging people because what ultimately happened in my case um I didn't realize this until literally a decade later that um, the stress of the exercise so soon after childbirth had caused an immediate um, problem in my body, which over other um, giving birth again and going through the same pattern of gaining weight, trying to lose the weight by over-exercising, um, ultimately found out that I had caused a prolapse, prolapse um, uh, vagina wall. Um, I f- I haven't said that in the right way, but prolapse vagina, um, which was absolute agony. It got to the point that I couldn't walk for me to go and do something about it because I was ashamed. And part of that is um, the story there is uh, as a woman, you have to go and get smear tests and things like that. I had one and the result came back abnormal. And the consultant made a comment about the reason for my abnormal smear result. And he said, well, it's basically because I'm a divorced mum and I don't have a, a husband that I've got this this issue now. Gosh. <laughs> I know. It's quite shocking, his, his, his uh, consultation, um, which when I started suffering more pain... It didn't make me want to go back to the GP and go, please look at my bits again. <laughs> there seems to be a problem down there. Um, so I didn't. And I ignored it and I ignored it and I ignored it to the point where I literally walking the dog would leave me doubled up in pain. And that was because the the wall of my vagina literally had lost its support and its structure and was not doing its job anymore. And it was absolutely excruciating. I cannot ex- it's, it's a horrible pain um, since, well, it was all brought on from over-exercising and just repeatedly going through that cycle of doing lots of exercise and then not, um, and not doing those pelvic exercises that everybody talks about, but nobody really explains. It's all kind of, oh, just squeeze down there. I know, yes. Well, I've seen that. I've, well, I've since learned there's a whole technique and there's a whole reason I've, I've had ultrasounds of um, my womb and squeezing and doing certain things. And you can actually see, like, you can cause more damage by not doing those squeezing exercises in the right way. Um, so there was, like, over the last couple of years, it's been a real education, actually, how my body works down there, um, which I really wish somebody had said, right, when you're pregnant, this yeah. is what's going to happen to your body. This is how, like, how much weight and pressure is put on down there. And if you don't deal with it properly, and this is how to deal with it properly, this could happen. And I think if people had that education early on, I wouldn't have gone out running with like crappy trainers on and like done five k's three times a week when literally my insides hadn't healed properly enough to cope with and that. Um, it's so important, isn't it? Yeah. Because you know, it, it isn't. It, it's the combination of pregnancy, of childbirth, and and not doing the exercises that really affects your pelvic floor. And I, you know, we have got a previous episode about pelvic floor, which you know I would recommend anyone listens to about how important it is for men and women. I will just say for men and women, um, but it's it's something that isn't necessarily routinely talked about. We talk about strengthening our chests our backs our muscles our our biceps our legs and everything but we don't talk about pelvic floor and when you think about where the pelvic floor is and those obviously can't see me but i'm holding my hand up um all the weight of our body gravity is pushing down on it so they need to be strong just to move us around in everyday life add the the pressure of a baby because you know baby weighs quite a lot and by the time you've got all the everything else that goes with it you've got a lot of pressure on it the fact that the muscles do loosen slightly it means that you know poor old pelvic floor takes a, a bit of a yeah it, it takes a lot of pressure yeah Take and, and, then you have the baby <laughs> and you know you can get your pelvic floor back but it takes time it mm-hmm. takes effort and it takes 
exercising it specifically. And like you've, you've found, if you try and do too much too soon, the poor pelvic floor isn't working properly. And as one of its role, we, we think of it as being like to do with incontinence, but it's also about supporting all your organs. So if you do too much too soon, that organ support's not there, which means that bits, you know, pop pop down to where they shouldn't be. And that's where you get the pain. So it is so important, isn't it? And, you know, for anybody who is thinking about going, thinking about exercising, who is thinking about pregnancy or anything like that, you know, do your pelvic floor exercises. In fact, everybody should be doing them, really. But um, I, I do think this is where, you know, more specific advice about exactly what they are, how to how to locate them, how to exercise them, but also why. Mm. Why you need to exercise it, not just to stop you having oops moments, but for things like, you know, to protect everything when, when you're running, when you're exercising and things like that. So one hundred percent. You got you did get you did get fit, didn't you, because you started doing triathlons. I did. That that it was a combination of wanting to get out of the house. The kids were a little bit older, um, wanted to meet like-minded people. It all started from getting some swimming lessons and learning how to swim properly. Um, and that stemmed my interest. Like, right, okay, I could swim a little bit quicker now. Um, what what can I do that's like interesting that um combined some several sports and it was I can't even remember how the connection I think I was just looking for a club or a hobby and I was googling I think I ended up at a netball club and a volleyball I was trying to find my thing and triathlons came up and it seemed so interesting that these crazy people were like putting on neoprene and jumping in the sea and swimming down to the pier and back and then they would jump out and run on the, like go on their bike and then they'd run and it just I think it was just the people that got me really interested and just the buzz and their excitement, enthusiasm for it and the variety and the different disciplines and um, being the type of person I am, I I, um, I do have ADHD. I was like, right, I'm going to do it. And if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it well. So I applied and like registered to do a half Ironman at Weymouth because it was like the nearest one. And it was the best experience I ever had. I mean, this was in 2018, um, so five years after my second baby, um, and I ha- I wasn't aware of my issues that I had, um, but ultimately all this did was compound those issues even more over time. Um, but saying that, it was a fantastic experience, and I highly recommend combining exercise with something that you love and with people that you love, because it wasn't just a swim session. It was a catch up with my mates and it wasn't just like a cycle ride. It was like a Sunday outing to the cake shop, but we did like a stupid amount of miles to do it. So I've got loads of exercise in and it wasn't just a run. It was an up and down the seafront. And then afterwards we'd have a natter and a catch up. So there was like elements to it um, that really helped it to be enjoyable and just like, oh, I'm just going to go for a run and catch up with Louise. I'm just going to go for a bike ride and Nigel's going to take me up the Winchester Hill and we're just going to like try and do some scary hills uh, downwards uh, together. And it was just the family aspect of um, having a club. And I I highly recommend if people want to get into sport and don't know where to start, find a friendly local club whether that's badminton or bowls or walking because it's the people that will make you keep going back it is we underestimate the social the social benefits of of you know activity in clubs but what you said before you're talking about triathlon was really really interesting because you were saying you tried um volleyball and you tried netball and things and i think this is the thing try different things don't just say, oh, that's not for me or oh, I'm not sure about that because there's so many opportunities out there for different activities. Try it. If you don't like it, no one, no one is going to say, well, you've been once, you've got to keep coming here for the rest of your life. If you sort of say, look, I've, I've given it a go, it's not for me, they'll be more than happy that you've at least given it a go. Um, yeah, there's for women particularly, there's, there's, there's walking netball if you're not up to running yet. There's uh, walking football now is growing for women. Yeah. But things like triathlon, and I know so many people, um, one of my other guests is a triathlete and, and does Ironmans. And, you know, she says the community is just so inclusive and, and just welcoming 
it's kind of like, hey, come and join us. You know, we, we want we want more people. And I think this is something that, that a lot of people are nervous about going to some of these clubs because they think it's going to be, oh, you're, you're a beginner. You know, you can't come here. We're all really good at what we do. But actually, these clubs thrive on their members. 100%. So yes. Go along and give it a go and say, oh, I really want to do this, but I'm no good at swimming. And they'll be able to advise you on swimming and they'll be able to advise you on cycling and the clothes to wear and everything. You know, there's, there's a reason why these clubs are popular, and that's because they welcome people in, don't they? And the, the coaching is phenomenal. If for your membership fee, it's huge, huge values for, for money, especially the club that I was, I was at, Ports of Triathletes. These people are dedicated to their, their craft. And for ultimately a few quid a month, you're getting really high quality training and access. Yes, you can go and get like a proper triathlete coach in regards to a very personalized, dedicated plan, which I did at one point. That's quite intense. I mean, there are different levels. There's people that are kind of GB athlete level, but they still train with everybody else who's like couch to 5K level, you know. So there, there was never any I'm a GP athlete, you know if anything, it's motivating and inspiring to see these people that are just normal people that love their their sport just as much as anybody else. And I think that's the important thing, isn't it? It's the inspiration. It's, it's you know, you might not be joining this club and thinking, I'm going to be a GP, GB triathlete, but you might be going thinking, these people can help me get a bit better. They can help me just knock a second off my swim time or a minute off my run time. And you know, we all have personal bests and they are just that, aren't they? They're personal to us. And this is where most of, of the athletes in, in things like this, whether they're elite, whether they're amateur, whether they're just beginner, whatever, are usually really, really happy to share what's helped them along the way. There's there's, there's a, lot, a lot less kind of protectiveness, if you like. There's a lot less kind of, oh, no, I've, I've learned this the hard way, so I'm not sharing it with anyone. There's a much more kind of sharing community, isn't there? Sense there of, is, there you know, is. Let's um, help. It's in person, and if you can make a good cake or take long biscuits, then they'll be your best friend. So Yeah. <laughs> and that's, that's the good thing. That's the good thing, isn't it, about sport, is, you know, you are burning off a lot of calories in yeah. a lot of these sports, which means that you get to eat some of the things that, you know, you love eating. And that's the balance that I think is so important, isn't it? It's that rather than restricting, mm-hmm. it's it's kind of the, the balance that goes on there. So you got really fit and then you dipped. Yes. Well, COVID happened. Um, so I wasn't doing the triathlon stuff anymore as such because we couldn't meet up. Um, I did my own fitness thing at home. You know, I was doing like I trained as a personal trainer. That's that's where my after ch- uh, my second child and losing all the weight, I was like, right, I'm going to l- do this properly. I now know what goes in, you know, exercise, like that balance, understanding nutrition, having some sort of, sort of plan. And people go, well, how do you do it? How did you do it? So I was like, right, I'm going to go and learn. So I did. And I, I got all the qualifications to do that. Then COVID hit. And I was like, oh, right, well, that's great isn't it you know can't do anything so did it online um and I think what happened there was we had the most amazing Easter and summer I don't know if you remember it's phenomenal like the weather like everybody was at home so everybody was quite relaxed so I was doing all these online things but when it come to the winter and like the new year I think everybody was just a little bit done in from all the the lock lockdowns and just like <laughs> we were a bit exercise fatigued and me personally I was you know like it's hard to be upbeat and motivating to people all the time when all you want to do is have a beer and a chocolate brownie yourself and you're just like oh and I felt a little bit of a fraud in that respect um and that's when my pelvic floor issues really really kind of hit an all-time low <laughs> more ways than one really <laughs> <laughs> and that's when I had to deal with that and kind of ease up on the exercises because I was doing too many squats I was doing really heavy weights um barbell exercises that weren't helping my situation um and even that actually really interesting me throughout all my studies pelvic floor and like after birth not really discussed you go to any personal trainer at your local gym especially a bloke and you mention actually look 
I've just had a baby, they will not consider the fact that everything down there is a little bit loose and you need to be conscious of certain exercises. Yes, they know that your um, abdominal area, you know, things like that, like you need special caution not to do setups and things, but people don't like to discuss the vagina area. <laughs> they like, I know, I'm... it's bizarre. It's bizarre, isn't it? And yeah, I mean, it's something that a lot of the courses I work on um, are, I deliver a lot of of fitness courses and they're either for people who are going through cancer treatment, um, which of course, pelvic floor is really, really important, um, particularly if it's in the the cancers in the pelvic region. Um, But also, um, you know, I do a lot of older adult training, pre and postnatal. And and in actual fact, I talk about pelvic floor virtually everything that I do purely because whatever else you're doing in your body if that's weak yeah that's going to limit you more so than than weak biceps or a weak chest if your pelvic floor is weak it's going to limit what you can lift what you feel comfortable lifting and things like that so i think it's such an important one isn't well, it's it it's part really of your core is. as well and your hip mobility yep. all these things come in so yeah come kind of third fourth lockdown whatever was going on 2021 I just had enough, you know, I needed to put myself first, needed to kind of rein in the the exercise side of of things. I mean, it's not fun being on the middle of a run in in a country park with no phone signal, bent over double thinking, how do I get help? I literally, because I'm of the mindset, I will push myself and push myself and push myself. But then it got to the point where it was actually a little bit dangerous. Um, So I had to kind of reconsider choices when it came to exercise and I I went to the opposite extreme did nothing you know just focused on recovery um and then what I've since learned more about my body how it works being I don't know what magic button gets pressed in your body when you hit 40 but something happens where it doesn't come off as easier as it did before you're like well I've got the same diet plan I'm doing the same amount of steps as I did before and nothing's moving well I must be doing something wrong and you're like well no I know the science and understand it but somehow my body has shifted into another dimension (laughs) it just doesn't operate in the same way anymore I think yeah I think it's called perimenopause and I think this is something that a lot of women don't realize is it actually starts you know we think oh menopause about 50 it starts a lot earlier and there are subtle little changes which when you know your body you start to recognize hang on a minute the weight isn't shifting or I'm not able to run in the same way and you start to recognize it but it it does get a little bit harder it's not impossible it's it's not like oh well that's it I might as well give up it just means you need to change kind of the way you look at things the way you do things the way you eat sometimes um, just to sort of compensate for that, because unfortunately it is a natural part of our physiology. It's not something you can avoid. I wish we could, you know, so yeah, actually, yeah, no. I don't think I bother with menopause. Um, <laughs> it's going to happen anyway. And it's, it's really interesting that there's so much more advice now about it. And there's so much more awareness of how it, it changes the way our bodies react to eating, to exercise, even to stress. Um, which is really really yes. good. So, one. So you got back in. So you got back into it though. So to have it, have yes, a bit yeah, of a yeah. lull. A little bit of a lull, but now it's more relaxed in regards to. I like to switch things up. I like to do the weights at the gym, or I go and do an exercise class, or I go and do swimming. But the one thing I did do, which I think helped, is I treated myself to a very nice gym membership. And the reason being is I used to hate going to the gym because gyms can be mucky. They're full of big, muscly blokes, you know, and sweaty and stinky. And the changing rooms are a little bit minging, you know, because they're looked after teenagers. And it's just like the local leisure centre, as lovely as they tried to be, it was just like, I don't like coming to this place. I feel like I'm going to get some disease every time I come into this place. So I thought, right, if I'm going to go in, it's going to be nice. So I did treat myself to a high-end gym membership and you know what that makes it a lot nicer to go to the gym so I'm more enticed to go and do a yoga class or to go and swim and then go in the sauna and the hot tub afterwards it feels more of a treat than a punishment and I think that's what's changed in regards so less takeaways a little bit less alcohol a little bit more funds towards a nicer gym membership and that to me 
is what works. I don't do it all the time, I must say, you know, being a business entrepreneur, you know, kids get ill. I do have those fluctuations still, but I'm I'm less inclined to not go as in I'm, I'll go back because it's a it's a respite you know because I get to sit in a lovely sauna and then go in the outdoor pool and that's amazing cold water um so yeah so I, I found something that works for me so if you're finding going to the gym or going to somewhere difficult then see what other options are because they're this not is all the thing all isn't it places. it's finding what works for you what fits in with you and you know for for some people the gym might not be an option for them but for you you've you've chosen something that says well do you know what I can go for a swim or I can go to the gym or if if I just need to go and have a sauna one day that's what I'll do it becomes part of it and it's like you Mm -hmm. say it's a treat it's important rather than oh gosh I've got to go to the gym I can't be bothered I'm going to get tired it's like no I'm going to the club where I can choose what I want to do depending on my mood and I think that's really important um for people is you know when you find what you like doing you'll want to do it, you'll look forward to doing it, you'll prioritise it. And what you like doing might be this one week or year, it might be something completely different next time. It might be something, you might move on to something completely different and off off the wall. And this is the thing, is don't think you've got to choose a way of exercising and stick with it for life. It's about trying different things. It's about saying, do you know what, this week I'm not in the mood for it. I'm not in the mood for the gym. I'm going to go and do a yoga class or I'm going to go for a swim. And it's it's responding to the way that your mind and body feel because that way, A, it becomes a much more holistic approach to activity. But also it means that you're not putting pressure on yourself to go to the gym. You, you, you're just saying, well, I am going to exercise, um, but I'm going to do it this way. Or I'm, do you know what? I might just go for a walk today because it's a lovely day. And I think that's mm. that's the thing, isn't it? It's try lots of different things, but work out what it is that that floats your boat at that time. And then what works yeah. for you? What what do you like to do? What's your what's your thing at the Me, moment? Me, I'm a walker. I walk. I um, I teach a lot of chair based exercise classes, so um, that's something I'll do. But I, I walk, I do a bit of yoga, I do a bit of strength training, but it's, again, it's what I feel like on the day. Um, mm-hmm. And it's, it's you know, I've been there, I've done the lot, you know, taught the lot, done the, everything. And for me, <laughs> as I say, walking plus some real whole body, body weight exercises or resistance bands, really, that's what I like. You know, I'm hoping to be able to get swimming a lot more in the summer because I do like a good swim. I do like a oh, good swim, yeah. Amazing. And I'm one of these yeah. people. I swim a little bit, not a strong swimmer, but I do a lot of kind of aerobics. Um, mm-hmm. So I'll, I'll grab myself some floats and things like that, and do all sorts of aerobics and stuff like that because I find that really good fun. Um, so I might not swim very much, but I do a lot in the water. But it, to me, it's it's what I feel like doing on the day. And I am actually mm-hmm. I'm looking into some of the things like walking netball purely because I, I like the idea of the camaraderie and the team spirit. Um, yeah, because I think you know a lot of the times exercise can be quite solitary, whereas when you get into sort of anything to do with a club or a team, you, you just it's just a little bit more of a social thing, isn't it? It's really really good. Yeah, it pushes out your comfort zone a little bit. You're more enticed to go along if there's something, if there's an event, or you're working towards something. Yeah, I think it. And I think we're we're because I don't know about you, I work on my own all the time. It's nice to have those meetups and those um get together yeah it is it's so important so how do you i mean being active being doing doing some sort of fitness or activity or anything how do you find it impacts on your business yes and no yes in a good way um i need to make it part of my day uh a battle of illness has, has meant the last few weeks i haven't done so but what i do is i schedule out the mornings so it, I'll only work after 11 and that morning bit is like you say walk the dog or go to the gym after the school run then come home and that works for me. it helps me mentally I feel just a little bit fresher and I feel like I've had a bit of a reset you know the blood obviously rushing to my brain gives me ideas and I feel a little bit better in myself I definitely notice when I don't do that I, I feel cloudier I feel foggier I feel sluggish um so I know that is 
time that I knew, need to schedule in. And then because it is my own business, I can schedule meetings around that time, you know, and go into the evenings. I know the best time for me to exercise is in the morning, get it done, get it out of the way. If I leave it and go, oh, I'll do it after the school run or I'll do it after dinner, it just doesn't happen because it's just like my, my brain's not in that right space. So I know that the only time I can do make that time is first thing in the morning. Um, and in a bad way is, like I said, if, if I don't do it, then it just everything just slides a little bit. And then it's like, oh, well, I didn't go today. I won't go tomorrow. So sometimes I do give, need to give myself a big kick up the bum and just go, right, just stop fanning around, get to the gym and do something. Get to the gym. It's it, 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 I do. And it's something I always say to people is if you want to create an activity habit, whatever your activity, chosen activity is, put it in your diary schedule yeah, it in schedule. make an appointment yeah. treat it treat it like you know an absolutely must do treat it like a dentist appointment yes. or you know meeting with your accountant because you then get in the habit of oh no I can't then that's that's what I go and your body kind of expects it your body's geared up for it whereas if you sort of say oh well I'll go to the gym three times this yeah. week you get to Friday evening and you say oh I'm exhausted and I've only I haven't been once and I've got whereas like you say, you know, find the best time for you. Now, some people, it's morning, others lunchtime, others it might be evening. It's what works for you and it's it's what you know will fit in with your life. Um, there's no point saying I'm going to exercise in the evening if you've got loads of kids and you've got to do meals and you've got to get ready for school yeah. the next day and things like that. It's it's saying, right, okay, this is a good time for me. And, and being realistic, if you've only got half an hour, then do half an mm -hmm. hour. If you, can, if you can do an hour, do an hour. But be realistic. Don't sort of say, right, I'm going to do an hour every single morning at 9 o'clock. If you know, you're just going to be thinking, oh, I've got that meeting and I've got this thing. Yeah. Plan, really plan, because once you're in the habit, like you say, when you don't do it, you you kind of notice the knock-on effect, Definitely. don't you? I mean, there have been occasions where I have gone to the effort of going to the gym and been on the treadmill for five minutes and then gone, I can't do this. It's either are too noisy, the people next to me are chatting too much, my socks are rubbing, my boobs are going everywhere. Yeah. And you're just like, ah, so I'm like, I'm leaving. <laughs> so it doesn't always go to plan. And it's not always perfect. But then I do say to myself, well, you did go in. So <laughs> yeah, we'll take that as a win. I'll always say, I'll say to people, you know, if you know, if you set your intention to go for a walk at seven o'clock in the morning, if you, if you, if you get out and it's just like, it's not going to happen, just stand outside your front door at seven yeah. o'clock. Keep the appointment, whether it's for five minutes or 50 minutes or however yeah. long. Keep the appointment. If you're not in the mood for yoga, just sit on your yoga mat for five minutes and just deep breathe. Yeah, keep the appointment, mm -hmm. even if it is only for a short time, because that way you just start to get in the habit. And once you're in the habit, you're like me, you're going out there at past five every morning in the pouring oh, wow. rain. <laughs> and, um, yeah, I'm one of those. I'm one of those. But I've done yes. it. I've got at least half of my activity in you know first thing in the morning and I know that if I don't do that I know how much I, I just just feel just sluggish yeah. for the rest of the day I just no I don't get that oh do you so what would be your advice then to somebody who's listening and sort of saying oh I'm really not sure what I want to be you know I want to try something but I'm not sure what research Think back to when you were a kid. What kind of things did you like? Did you like PE? Did you like tennis? Did you like running? You know, and go back. The best yeah. things that I've enjoyed so far is running. I used to love running as a kid. Running through the woods in the rain, in the mud, and you've got trainers that you don't care to get smashed. It is the most liberating and freeing thing. I just You just laugh and giggle because you're caked in mud and you're wet and you just think... I'm 30 something or I'm 40 something and oh my god I should be doing this but it's so much fun so just kind of get back to that inner child and just do some silly things because we're going to be dead one day or you're going to be sat in that old people's home going I really wish I'd done such and such just do it yeah. <laughs> just get out there and have fun and that that's what do you know what that's one of my key messages that I always try and bring through is you know whatever you do make sure that you enjoy it make sure that it's fun and I really like that that kind of think back to what you used to like doing as a kid was it cycling you know was it running with your mates was it kind of more of a team sport because chances are if you liked it mm -hmm. then 
there'll be a way that you can get back into it now, even if it is like, say, walking netball or walking football rather than the actual running versions. There's still ways to do it. And it, but once, once you find, once you rediscover the, the fun, yes. the enjoyment, I think it just starts to become much more easy, doesn't it? It does. It does. Brilliant. Sarah, thank you so, Sarah Jane, thank you so much for talking to us. Tell us just a little bit about where people can find you if they want to know more about your Etsy. Business. So you can find me all over social media, any platform as SJ Etsy Queen, and my website is sj lewis l e w i s dot com. Brilliant. And so people can come and find you to sort of get advice on anything to do with Etsy. Yes, if you're a crafter or an artist and you want to sell your your goods from your kitchen table, from your craft room, from your shed, wherever that may be then uh, come and get in touch so I can help you optimise your handcraft business so that you can make money from your passions. Which is what we all want. Thank you so much for coming along. You've been listening to me, Sarah Belitha, and my guest, Sarah Jane Lewis. We will see you on the next episode of Creating Active Lives. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for listening to Creating Active Lives with me, Sarah Belitha, and my guest. Join me each week for more on how to create and sustain everyday activity and follow me online at fitness career mentor or fab newness if you're interested in career development and more on creating active lifestyles